challenging him, I'm going to introduce you to Barbara, who is going to introduce you to the entire group. Thank you so okay. much for coming. Thanks, Debbie. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Danny. I have read the assignment as promised, <laughs> and I think almost all of our folks have today. Uh, Danny Shapiro is the author of the instant New York Times bestseller, uh, A Memoir Inheritance, which was published in January 2019 by NAV. Her other books include the memoirs Hourglass, Still Writing, Devotion, and Slow Motion, and five novels, including Black and White and Family History. Along with teaching, writing, workshops around the world, Danny has taught at Columbia and NYU and is the co-founder of the Sir Siren Land Writers Conference in Positano, England, uh, Italy, which is a place we'd all like to be right now, even if we have to isolate there. Um, I don't know, Italy's had a lot of trouble with the pandemic. How do you think it is in Positano today? I think it still would be a pretty good place to be um, <laughs> quarantined. If I could, if I could teleport myself there right now, I would do that. Danny, I had a, a report of um, of your talk about inheritance uh, from my sister who lives in Bronxville, New York, and heard you speak at uh, Sarah Lawrence College. Oh, and and I know that's your uh, college, isn't it? It is, yeah. So, uh, folks, if you have questions. Uh, raise your hand or put put an indication in the chat and we'll get started. Um, Danny, I was curious about, in talking about the relationship with your dad, you mentioned, you described so many scenes being with him at synagogue and, and participating in Jewish rituals in the Orthodox tradition that he was a part of. And But you're not observant today, so when did he, was he aware of your having left orthodoxy? How did that figure into your relationship and your thinking about him when you found out that he was not your biological mm -hmm. father? That's a great question. Um, yes, my father was aware that I um, was no longer um, observant at some point in my teenage years. And, you know, I should back up and say, I don't, I don't remember really how much of this background was in inheritance because it 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 didn't it didn't directly pertain to the story that much. But my my mother, while Jewish, was not was not observant, um, and never had been. Um, in fact, would have described herself as an atheist. And she married my father. You know, when when they married, the deal was um, that they would keep an observant home and that any children would be raised Orthodox. Um, but she wasn't a believer, and um, and he certainly was, and he came from an observant family, um, and you know I think as is pretty clear for those of you who have read the book, I was much closer to my father than to my mother, um, and my sense of connection with him had a lot to do with who he was when he was davening and who he was when he was praying. Um, it was where he was most happy. It was where he was most at home. Um, at the same time, I don't think I ever thought that I would grow up and remain Orthodox. Um, it just wasn't in the cards. It wasn't in my childhood. It wasn't in the, the way that I was raised in the community that I was raised in. I went to a, um, a Jewish day school until I was in seventh grade, and then I went to a prep school. Uh, you know, so it was very, I had a lot of um, confusing um, messages. Or here's another thing I actually, on my podcast, Family Secrets, the most recent episode, uh, my guest was a friend of mine who's a rabbi named David Ingber, who's an absolutely spectacular rabbi in New York City. And part of our converse, conversation that was really illuminating for me is that David was raised modern Orthodox. Um, and I asked, as I was, and I asked him to speak to listeners who might not know what that is. And he really just gave this remarkably clear um, sort of description of what it was to be raised modern Orthodox, where he had cousins and other parts of his family who were Orthodox Orthodox, and always this feeling that they were doing it right somehow, and that 
modern orth orthodoxy for him created this kind of strange sort of split or division between like, well, I want to listen to this music and I want to date girls and I want to, you know, and I'm doing inappropriate, you know, I'm like looking at inappropriate magazines at my friend's house. But, you know, after sitting at Shabbos, you know, lunch davening and like it was, it was neither here nor there. And that's very much how I was raised. And so I would say that when I found out, you know, all those years later, that my dad hadn't been my biological father, um, it it sort of underscored what was a tension that was there. Um, nothing to do with my, you know, my, my love for him or his love for me, but a tension that was there because um, there was something in all of it that didn't quite add up in my childhood. Um, but yeah, I mean, from the time my mother stopped eating kosher at some point when I was a teenager. And she did so with a vengeance. We would be out to dinner and she would order, like he, my father would say, order whatever you want. I remember the first time he said that because we were, we would go out to dinner and, you know, eat, eat fish or eat, you know, um, I mean, they, he wasn't so orthodox that he would only eat in a kosher restaurant. We would go out to, you know, to regular restaurants. But the first time he said, order whatever you want, I think my mother ordered like the shrimp or, you know, the sweetbreads. I, I never did that. I could never, ever bring myself to eat non-kosher in front of my father. I never did. But I knew that he knew. And he was signaling that he knew by saying, order whatever you want. Anybody else have a question? I do, Barbara, if I may. Yes. Um, First of all, Danny, I can't help but notice the pictures behind you, mm. and I bet they're pictures of your family. I, 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 I'd like to hear a little bit about that. I want to um, also thank you very much for um, making us a little bit more sensitive about the, the plight of independent bookstores. Many of our members, as you know, did order your book, and thank you very much for autographing um, them. Um, but my main question has to do with ethics. Many of us in this group have uncovered family secrets, deep, dark family secrets that would be very disruptive to family narratives. And since you've been on the receiving end of um, a disruptive family secret, what would you suggest that we do with what we know if we haven't been necessarily been asked to participate in sharing? What do we do with the information that we have? That's such a huge question, Debbie. Um, and I've got to say that since since Inheritance was published in January of 2019, I have heard countless, countless stories of people uncovering different kinds of family secrets. It's, it, it was like my book was published directly into the moment where the combination of DNA testing being so easy and so much fun and um, and so many people doing it and the internet and how much is available to us that we can that we can uncover um, has has created you know kind of I guess the word that I started using a lot is a reckoning you know like a real reckoning of like what do we do with what we discover and there's not one sort of easy one size fits all answer to this. I mean, you used the you used the term like disrupted the narrative, the family narrative, and that's a really interesting way of 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 talking about it because our narratives, whether it's narratives about our identity or narratives about our family, are just that they're narratives. I mean, that's one of the things that I really learned is the narrative that I had about myself, you know, from the time that I was born and from the time that I could start putting thoughts together was actually not true. I mean, it simply was not true. And and I, I actually think it had a lot to do with my becoming a writer. I, I think I, you know, from the time that I started writing my early fiction, I was digging and digging and digging for something that was really elusive. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that something, I knew that something didn't add up I could not, I, I had no knowledge or even glimmer of a thought that it could possibly be what it ended up being, but I knew something didn't add up. And I think 
that when, I mean, at least my experience, my, my personal experience, and then the stories that people have shared with me and in all the research that I did, when there's something like that, that's there, that's sort of lurking in the shadows, it's not like it just goes away because, um, because either we don't know it yet or we don't talk about it or, you know, there are the keep, there are the keepers of the secret and then there are the discoverers of the secret. Um, but it's always there mm -hmm. and in some way like wedges itself into families, whether or not it's being talked about or not. It, it, it impacts behavior. It creates intergenerational trauma without even, with, with, without an awareness of what, of what it is. Um, and yet at the same time, I mean, I've heard a lot of stories where somebody discovers a secret and like, let's say their sibling doesn't know and doesn't want to know, or their, um, you know, their, they have a parent who's alive, who's never known something like who's, what right do we have to share our stories when our stories can impact other people is just a huge, it's a huge ethical question. And I think that part of a piece of the answer is, has to do with when we find out what we find out. I mean, I found out about my father long after both of my parents were gone. Um, would I have written this book if my father was still alive? No. Um, would I have written it if my mother was still alive? Maybe. Um, but I certainly thought about that. And, you know, what would it have meant to be able to sit down with my parents and talk with them about this? I mean, one of the more heartbreaking uh, kinds of stories that, that have come to me a lot are parents who never told their kids something about their identity. Um, and then they, they, they often read, they read my book, um, or they just started to really know what was going on in terms of DNA testing and the realization of my kids are going to find out what do I do? You know, I was always going to take this secret to the grave with me, but I have the opportunity to tell my children that that this was a secret that was kept from them and try to explain to them why and try to explain to them how 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 much or how little it meant um and there's 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 a lot of i think that kind of story going on um as well thank do you. you do you wish your parents had told you you see i mean that's where it just gets really interesting and complicated because given that my, my dad died when I was 23 um, and I was a very fragile uh, young person in a lot of ways. If I had found out around that time or earlier than that, I think it would have been utterly devastating to me um, and, and terrible for me to have found out around that time, partly because even though many, many thousands of people had been um, conceived by donor, no one told their kids. In my generation, no one told their kids. I have yet to hear a story where anyone told their kids. Sometimes um, the mother would tell after the father died or, the, or there would be a letter left in a safety deposit box or or there would be a medical crisis that would come up that would necessitate being told. But for the most part, no one was ever told. So if I had been told as a child or as a teenager, as a young woman, I would have felt like the only person in the entire world who had this story. And nobody ever wants to feel like they're the only person in the entire world who has a story. So it would have been terrible. And I think one of the things I've come to, to, to realize about secrets is that when we find them out is as important as what we find out. And I feel very, very fortunate that I was at a point in my life where I was um, in a very long-term stable uh, family, you know, relationship of my own um, with a, you know, with a, a, a very contented, stable, grounded life. 
and career. And my son was 17 when I found out he was already, you know, largely, you know, baked, you know. Um, and I, I, I've I, also heard stories where people make these discoveries and they're 80 something years old and they can't, there's nothing, there's, they can't find anything out. They, they, they can't, they, they're not able to learn anything about what happened. And, you know, when, when I made this discovery, it was kind of like right at the sweet spot of being able to handle it. A time when many, many, many people were making these discoveries. So there wasn't a sense of being a complete, you know, like freak of nature, which is really what it feels like to make, to make the discovery that the person who thought was your parent was not your biological parent is initially so destabilizing that to be able to just Google it and discover, oh, this is a thing. People, people are finding this out all over the place. They're creating support groups. And, you know, I mean, that, that was um, an amazing thing. And then um, that there, was, there were still people who were living who could shed some light on this for me, who could maybe, you know, I never got, you know, the smoking gun, so to speak. I never, I never had somebody say to me, yes, I knew this had happened. Your parents, you know, had confided in me, nothing like that, because I don't think my parents ever confided in anyone. I think they did what many, many couples did at that time, which is they planned on never telling a soul. They never, they were told to go home and forget that it ever happened. They were told, you know, never tell anyone, don't tell your own parents, don't tell your siblings, don't tell your friends. The child will never know. It doesn't make any difference. What we don't know won't hurt us. It's best for everyone this way. And so the parents would go home and absolutely just bury it, bury it, bury it to such, to such an extent that they even buried it from themselves. Just changing the narrative of your life is is traumatic enough. I discovered that my grandmother's siblings were not murdered by the Nazis in Belarus, but escaped to Siberia. And I have actually met the sec I still get chills. I met the second cousin. Wow. Met many second cousins who now live in Buffalo. But anyway, um, but just that change in the narrative. I, my relationship to the Holocaust completely changed. Yes. I would always tell people that my grandmother's entire family was wiped out by the invasion of the Nazis into Belarus. No. Yes. Yes. And that's 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 tough. Yes. To handle, but th this kind of uh, story is also. Anybody else? Looks like Mark Vanderpai. I I have a I was just thunderstruck Danny by the fact that men are out there providing semen for all of these kids. And it never occurs to them to wonder what's happened to all of their biological children. That would just haunt me, but evidently men are doing this all over the world and it's just like another day at the races. <laughs> I just thought, what a, what a deep ethical question and none of them seem to ponder it. Well, it's so interesting. I mean, it, maybe it's self-selecting, maybe the men who would ponder it wouldn't do it or to some degree um but it's not that simple i think um so much well let's let's talk about it throughout you know these decades right so the men who donated sperm um in the you know 50s, 60s, 70s, they were, they entered the same kind of world as the parents did. And it was a world in which it's no big deal. It's nothing more than giving blood. It's like giving a, maybe a kidney or a cornea. Um, and they were guaranteed anonymity. There was no reason to ever think anything otherwise. They were making some pocket change and feeling like they were doing something, you know, for science or, you know, good for a family. And 
Because at the time, I mean, DNA, the discovery of DNA was relatively new. The idea that it could ever be discoverable was completely like science fiction, that it could ever be discoverable. And I think to go back to like how secrets are made and kept and buried, I think that if, if you think that something can't be discoverable, you can also hide it from yourself to some degree. It's sort of like the perfect crime. You know, it's like, it's just like, it didn't happen. And my biological father, who is a really thoughtful person and is an ethicist, um, you know, like thinks about ethics professionally. When he said to me, the thought that I had biological children out there or that they would ever contact me was just something that never crossed my mind. But then here's another example. I was two summers ago speaking at the Sun Valley uh, Writers Conference in Sun Valley, Idaho. And there, it's a big, big conference of readers and writers. And I was speaking about Inheritance, which had just recently come out. And there was a very large audience, like 1,500 people there. And so I mentioned that because it was the kind of thing that people would flock to, even if they didn't know what that particular speaker was going to be speaking about, you know, they would just show up. It was the main stage. And afterwards, I was about to be taken over in a golf cart to a place where I was going to be signing books. And a man was standing by the golf cart waiting for me after I had just finished speaking. And he looked to be in his 80s. Um, and his eyes were like brimming with tears. And he said, um, he introduced himself to me, he's a physician. And he said, I um, was a, do a donor at the Ferris Institute in the 19, you know, late 1950s, early 1960s. And I think at that moment, he was so confused that he thought maybe that I could be his biological daughter, uh, even though the speech that I just had given made it clear that I, I knew who my biological father was, but I think something kind of snapped in him where he realized that there were, that it, be, it became real. And it became real that there were probably human beings out there that were his biological children. And I ended up meeting him for a glass of wine at the end of the day, and we had a really heartfelt talk. And he had his, he's, you know, I've had men who were sperm donors say to me, well, I'm never going to do my DNA testing because I don't want anybody to be able to find me, which of course, for any of you who know anything about, you know, DNA testing, that, that logic doesn't hold. I mean, you don't have to have a DNA test in order to be discoverable. Your nephew could, your grandchild could, your second cousin could, and you're discoverable. What this doctor said to me that day in Sun Valley, and he really was very emotional. He said, the first thing I do when I get home is I'm going to do a DNA test so that if I have offspring out there, if they wish to, they can find me. Mm. And it was just a beautiful response, you know, but it, they're, these are, they're very individual responses because another thing that happens is with my biological father, I am the only, um, and he has three children, he and his wife have three children, but I'm the only offspring from his, his brief career donating sperm that, that we're aware of. There might be more, but given how popular DNA testing is and how out there my book was, and it, my chances are that I may be the only one, which is very unusual. So I haven't like ruined their lives by you know, by appearing in their lives. It's been complicated for us all, but it's not an upending thing. What about the men who have 47 offspring? <laughs> what about the men who, I mean, especially after sperm started to be able to be frozen, you have situations where there are biological siblings who are, or half siblings, you know, biological half siblings, who might be 40 years apart in age mm -hmm. because the sperm stays frozen. 
and the, I mean, the ethics and the business of it, the, I mean, so here is where I actually have become kind of politicized about this. Like, I understand what happened around the time that I was conceived. I understand how people waded into it with, with kind of eyes half open, not wanting to see, just wanting to, parents who just wanted to have a child, thought secrecy was fine. Men, you know, medical students, you know, and other, other kinds of, you know, young men, you know, just out of, you know, just not, not thinking it through and, and just not thinking it was a big deal. But now we know differently and we know that genetics matter. I mean, I gave incorrect medical history for my entire life. Um, confidently, you know, sure that my, my dad's medical history was mine. Um, we know that secrets are toxic. We know that people have a right to their own identity and it's much better to go through life with the narrative being as accurate as possible. Um, and we also know that people will find out the truth now, like that horse has fled the barn. We know that there can't be any more anonymous sperm donation or for that matter, egg donation. And yet there are still plenty mm. of parents out there who are using donors and not telling their children. And there are also plenty of these agencies who, um, you know, it's like the, uh, you know, it's like an agency. It's like if you were looking at real estate or you were looking at, um, you know, Airbnb, uh, except it's donors, right? And you see their, you know, their, their information, their description of, you know, who they are and where they've been educated and their health and their, you know, whatever information is available. And you will see next to many of them, um, anonymous. There, I mean, some are listed as open, meaning I am open to a biological child contacting me in 18 years. Um, I'm, I'm open to my identity being known or anonymous. And, and it makes me so angry that anyone thinks that that is okay in this day and age because we do know better. And so the only reason that that's even still up there that way is because it's a big business. And these agencies believe that men won't donate if they realize that they can be, that they can't be anonymous, but they can't be anonymous. So, I mean, when, when, at, at, when, when I do events or, you know, before the pandemic, when I would be, you know, in, in, in person, uh, often people would raise their hands and it would be um, a therapist saying, you know, I, I have, I have a patient who had, you know, a, had a baby using a donor and isn't planning on, is on the fence about whether they're ever going to, you know, they're ever going to tell. And what, I don't, do you have any advice? What do you, and, and my, I really wanted to arrive at something that was true, useful, and not judgmental. Because I do have my feelings about what's ethical and what's moral, but like take that out of the equation. And my response is, they're going to find out. That's all. They're going to find out. So best they find out from, 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 from the parent. Um, but yeah, it's, and, and as far as donors are concerned, they're going, they're, they are, they're going to be discoverable. So, um, and there are lots of donors who are fine being discoverable, but it, it just, it just, we are the only country in the developed world, um, that doesn't have a limit on the number of offspring a donor can produce. Um, that doesn't have, there's no checks, or, there's no checks or balances in this country, um, when it comes to, um, assisted reproduction, none. I mean, in, in, in France, in the UK, in China, in Germany, in Sweden, 
you know, uh, everywhere. Uh, there are um, all over Asia. Um, sometimes the number of, of offspring a donor can produce is one. Sometimes it's five. In a few of these countries, it's up to 20 or 25, which is a lot. But here there's, no, there's nothing. There's no, you know, there, there, there are no regulations. You, you mentioned in the book that Dr. Ferris was practicing without a license. Mm -hmm. Had he ever gone to medical school? No, he, he was a scientist. He had a PhD. Um, he, I mean, he, his practicing without a license was a quote that another one of his colleagues said to me. In fact, it is possible that Ferris never actually performed the inseminations himself. Um, he had, I later discovered he did have a medical doctor at the Ferris Institute who would actually do the inseminations, but it was, um, he, you know, he presented himself as a, a medical doctor and it's why he was ousted from the Worcester Institute where he had begun his career um, because the MDs there um, started getting very upset at, at, you know, sort of what he was up to because it was a, a medical procedure insemination. And you were never able to find records from that clinic, were you? No, I mean, I, I think the records were probably destroyed. I mean, Ferris died suddenly um, in his 50s. Um, his institute continued for another 15 years or so. Um, but there, I don't, I, I don't think that there were any records. I did you know, what's really interesting about having a book like this out in the world is over time, um, things continue to unfold. And I did receive a note from a woman who had been um, a receptionist at the Ferris Institute uh, as a very young woman in Philly. And I ended up speaking with her. Um, not that much really was illuminated by speaking with her. I mean, she didn't, she couldn't, she couldn't really tell me what, what went on. Um, she wasn't really privy to it, but she did tell me one kind of completely amazing thing, which is, so there was an, there was an MD who was also working with Ferris at the point where I was conceived. And um, his name was a Dr. Murphy. And she said to me, this woman who, who contacted me, the receptionist is Jewish. She said to me, Murphy was a racist and an anti-Semite. And when Ferris suddenly died, she was let go. She was told she did not need to return. And I, and I guess he died in the office. He just dropped dead and it was very traumatic. And a few weeks later, a friend pointed out an ad in the newspaper that a medical office at that address was looking for a new receptionist um, and specified that the receptionist be Christian. Huh. So, I mean, that actually raises an incredibly interesting and unanswerable question, which is if Murphy was the doctor who actually uh, performed the insemination on my mother, had my parents asked for a Jewish donor and Murphy was like, I think I'm just going to find some nice Presbyterian sperm for you. You know, who, who knows? I'll never know. I'll never know. It makes it all the more strange and random and, um, and yet also miraculous, you know, it, it's, it's, it's many things, but that's something that I did, that I did find out. Um, one other thing I did find out was another woman contacted me, actually her, one of her daughters had contacted me who had been conceived at that institute. And I asked her if she thought her mother would speak with me. Uh, and she did, this was a woman in her eighties. And she said a few things to me. She, and she, her children were conceived at the Ferris Institute the same time period as my parents would have been going there. So that was literally as close to the room where it happened as I was ever gonna get. Um, and she told me that she and her husband sat across the table from the doctor that 
blood type was discussed, uh, physical characteristics were discussed, religion was discussed, um, and that Ferris told her that even if a man was completely sterile, he would never tell him that because he would always want there to be like that hope or that possibility that the child was biologically his. And they would go so far as to when they would, when a woman would become successfully pregnant, like in her case, she received a phone call saying, congratulations, Mrs. So-and-so, this is wonderful news, you're pregnant, but you know we have to tell you, the blood work shows that the levels are high enough that you must have already been pregnant when you got here. Hmm. So they went to great lengths to foster a climate of where in which denial would be a completely possible thing if a couple wanted to go there. It almost seems sinister. Yeah. In some ways. I, Danny, did you see uh, the film, the documentary, Three Identical Strangers? Mm -hmm. I figured you had. Um, talk about the ruin um, you know, of those three boys when they just, the way, as you say, it's, it's just about the timing as well as, you know, the, the discovery of the secret. It was, that was a horrifying story. Um, what happened to those three boys when they discovered that they were triplets, that they had been separated. And certainly that agency seemed very sinister. In terms I agree. Of the way they dealt I, with it. I, you know, I, I went to see that film, I think the day that it came out. And I remember um, sitting in the movie theater and well, a couple of things is just coincidentally, my husband and I have a connection to um, Dr. Neubauer, the, the really, uh, you know, evil, I don't use that word lightly, doctor in that, in, you know, in that documentary, his son is a friend of ours and his, grand, his grandkids and, and, our, and our kid grew up together. And I always knew that the grandfather was a famous child psychologist or a, psych a psychiatrist. But so that was that, that, but I kept on thinking, you know, this was one of the things I had to really learn and think a lot about and still do is, you know, when I was talking before about um, the way things were um, back in the time that I was conceived and, and even earlier, as opposed to the way they are now, I had to really learn not to judge the past by the standards of the present, um, and not to think, not to judge my parents by the standards of what I would today as a parent do. Um, there's a there's a really beautiful ethical term called retrospective moral judgment, and retrospective moral judgment. Um, is you know, considered a kind of unwise way of looking at history. And watching Three Identical Strangers, I saw the difference because those boys would have been around the same age as, as me. That decision to separate triplets would have been made around the same time as, as I was conceived. I believe that I was conceived with everyone believing that their intentions were good. That it was everything that they did, they believed was for the best, including for the best of the child, even though it's absolutely impossible to really understand that by our um, psychological you know, standards of today. However, Peter Neubauer and Jewish Family Services and what was done to those three the, to, to those triplets is outside of those bounds. Like that doesn't, it doesn't take retrospective moral judgment to understand how incredibly wrong it was to separate triplets in, in the name of an experiment and to have the adoptive parents of those triplets never know that there were two other two others out there. I mean, there were moments where those parents, one of the fathers said, I would have taken all three. Um, so it was like in the name of just, of science and, you know, science excusing or forgiving, 
you know, anything as if, as if babies were, you know, lab rats. Um, so it was a very, very different, when I got to that part in the film, something really broke open in me. I mean, I remember sitting sobbing in the theater and I thought my parents, they were, they were just two desperate, infertile people in 1962 trying to have their own baby, you know, trying to, that's what they were doing. And, you know, yeah. I've got a question. Uh, do you know how prevalent the, uh, these days in the United States where women are using donor sperm to have a child? Oh, there's, there, I, I mean, I don't have statistics, but it's, it's very, very common practice. I mean, it's, it's in a, in a variety of ways, it's common practice. Um, it's certainly if it's um, a lesbian couple, they're using donor sperm. But I will say something about that. Um, same sex couples, either men or women, have been at the forefront of transparency and honesty and, um, you know, par partly because they, they have to. I mean, you know, baby came from, you know, there, there had to be a third party, but th those families have often in my, in my experience and what I've observed, been um, some of the healthiest and happiest families because there was no secrecy or shame involved in any of it. It was just, you know, we love each other and we love you and this is how we, this is how we did it. And we had a helper and you know, it was very, very transparent from a very early age. Um, I, lots of women who are, are, are single mothers by choice use donors. Um, I have several, several, several of them are friends of mine. One of them is actually pregnant right now. And, and I had a hand in making sure that she chose a donor who would be open to being contacted. It hadn't occurred to her that that would be important. And this is a very smart lady. Um, and then, yeah, there are, are, are a lot, I mean, what's happening, what's starting to happen is that male infertility, which in a, heterosexual couple would be the reason to use a sperm donor. Male infertility is being, it's being solved. Um, it is possible today, someone like my father who had, you know, just not great sperm, not, but not impossible. They would have been able to isolate a sperm, find the healthy sperm, extract it, you know, and, and through a through a process I believe called ICSI, um, allow for the possibility that an embryo could could grow and then be, you know, so that a couple could have a, a, a child that was entirely their biological child. So as male infertility recedes, I think the need for sperm donors will also recede, but there will always be um, there'll, there'll always be a need for sperm donors. But you know, it's if you if you want to go down a rabbit hole, you know, when we get off this call, Google, you know, uh, sperm donation agency, it will blow your mind. You will not believe how many people are out there in this in this business of um, sperm and egg donation. Young women donating their eggs for, for you know so that infertile women can carry and 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 use the husband's sperm and 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 actually one other thing about that women who use egg donors and and then carry and deliver the baby themselves are the most unlikely to tell the child the truth hmm. of any of the populations the 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 thinking goes something like I'm your mother. I carried you. I gave birth to you. What's a little bit of cellular matter in this? It's 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 a, it's a very strong, almost primitive desire to make the idea that nature or genetics matter at all, like to make that go away. And you know, one of the things I've now been talking about for a year and a half 
because people would say to me, are you saying you think that genetics are all that matter? You think only nature matters? I'm not remotely saying that. I know how much nurture ma matters. I know how much my father meant and means to me, you know, biology be damned, but he wasn't my biological father. And a lot of, as it turns out, a lot of my traits, a lot of my characteristics, my temperament actually come from this perfect stranger who donated sperm, you know, 58 years ago. So it, 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 it does matter. It all matters. It's, but it's the desire to make it kind of like obliterate that, which I understand people are, the desire is because they want to, they just, they want to forget that it ever happened and just go on with their lives. And, and they lose sight of the fact that we all have a right to know as much as we can of the narrative, as Debbie said. Danny, a lot of us are jealous of your husband, Michael. <laughs> What we're jealous of is that you have a partner who not only has supported you through all of this, but was actively engaged in research. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of our spouses, well, we have a lot of spouses here today, but a lot of our spouses are not interested in. Yeah, it, it's, um, I don't know that I could have done this without Michael. And um, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I don't know. Well, first of all, I probably never would have done a DNA test either because he was the one who encouraged me to do it. So I think he felt badly about that. <laughs> um, but he was, he was, I mean, he, he spent years as a reporter before he became a screenwriter and filmmaker. And he, you know, he loves nothing more than chasing down the facts. And he, and he also, he, look, we have, we have a, we have a child together. I think one of the first thoughts that he had was there is a mystery now when it comes to our son, who's his biological grandfather on, um, you know, he, one out of four grandparents is a question mark. That was very personal for him. He later told me it's something he thought about right away you know, what, how, you know, what, what, who, who is this question mark within, within our son Jacob? Have you, um, have you or Michael looked into the family tree of your biological father? Have you started to trace it uh, back? We didn't, we didn't even have to, he gave it to me. He, he gave it to me and, um, and it's an, it's an amazing family tree. Um, and, Part of what's amazing about it is just how different it is from the one that I, um, you know, to go back to what, what Barbara was saying before, like, you know, just how, you know, my narrative was, uh, I come from the shtetl, you know, like all of, all of my, I mean, I was mo three, three out of four of my grandparents were born in this country, but you know, going back, it was all Belarus and, and that's where I come from. And I don't know, you know, why I look so different from most of my family, but that's just some weird genetic, you know, fluke. I then find out that my biological father's family, I mean, they were, they were settlers in this country. They came over on the Mayflower. Um, you know, you, you can't get more different mm -hmm. You know, my my mother and my biological father would never have encountered each other. Not just because they were different ages, but they were they were such, from such utterly different universes. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, without without identifying too much, because I'm always careful about his privacy. But I was this summer. I was um, I was in New. I mean, I live in New England, but I was on 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 one of the you know, one of the like really historic areas, you know, where the settlers first landed. And there was a, a sign to the oldest house in that area. And I just had a feeling and I looked it up. And sure enough, um, ancestrally, I mean, my forebearers biologically built that house. Mm -hmm. And there I am standing and looking at it and, and, and I've seen portraits of them and I've seen, you know, there's, there's a lot of history. I mean, there's history that goes back to the 1600s and um, 
what's what's weird about that though or or interesting uh and i'm curious over time like you know you asked debbie about like what's behind me like yeah those are that i don't know what you can see yeah like that we can picture see up there is my father and my aunt shirley as children and then you know there's a picture of my father and, and his father and my parents on their wedding day and you know and then an assortment of other you know more recent photographs but like i I feel psychologically very connected to the Shapiros and their history. But as it turns out, it's not my history. It is my history in the sense that I believed it to be for a long time. And I felt a real tug of pride and connection um, and belonging. But then there's this other history that I did not grow up with, but is in fact true. And... So what does that mean? Like the, the, the really deep questions of like, what, who are our ancestors to us? And why do they matter? Are they, do they matter because they're the stories that were told? Because if that's why they matter, then the stories that I was told were about the Shapiros. Um, do they matter because sort of somehow genetically, intergenerationally, you know, we are, you know, we, we are, we are literally descended from people. Well, if that's the case, then it's these other people. And, you know, I, I had something, my, my, my biological father sent me a newspaper, archival newspaper uh, clipping that was an essay that had been written by his, like, great, great, great grandfather, some number of greats, um, that was published in, in a newspaper and then republished in a very prominent newspaper that was um, taking a very strong stand against the Fugitive Slave Act. Hmm. And, and I was like, I had this weird flush of pride. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, but I don't deserve, like what, what right do I have to be proud of someone who I didn't even know existed? Um, and yet I am descended from, and or would I have felt shame if it was the other way around? Um, it's all, it's, it, it continues to, it just continues to be very interesting to me. I, I, I'm, I'm less emotionally tangled up in it now, you know, four and a half years into this and more, um, I'm really interested in the philosophical questions and I mean, the fact that I'm a writer, that Inheritance is my 10th book. I've been writing about identity and family secrets all my life as a writer. And so in a way, there's this kind of beshert feeling of, um, you know, in some way, maybe this is what I'm here to do. This is what this is. Like the thing, the moment in, in the book where Rabbi David Waltby says to me, everyone feels other. You've been... Um, You've, you've gone to the front of otherness and, hold on, sorry. Um, my son was calling me. Um, you've gone to the front of otherness and you're coming back with something to teach us. I took that really seriously because not everybody grapples with these thoughts and questions. You know, they don't have to. I, I had to, I was, you know, I, at least I felt that I had to. It was, I, I, there was so much that I felt that I needed to know and understand. Annie, I can ask you a question. It's what I felt when I was reading the book and it came up again. Do you still feel a connection to the Shtetl part of your family? I'm assuming you're, maybe your mother's, one of your mother's sides is, is there, but I wondered about that because it almost sounded like at one point that you had, you felt divorced from it in some ways. No, oh no, I don't, I don't feel divorced from it. My, my mother's, my mother's family is from, from Vilna. Um, and my, my father's family was from, from this little, little shtetl that was sort of m almost mythologized in many ways in, in, in our family, because there was this documentary where my grandfather and great grandfather went back and there was footage, you know, that I grew up knowing about and seeing. Um, I don't feel divorced from it. I feel like it's part of a larger it's like when you're making a stew and it's like there's like there's a there's there, there are more ingredients in there 
then then I knew. But it's not like that ingredient isn't in there anymore. It's just that there's there's more. There's more. There's more flavors. There's more. You know. There's there's more stuff than I knew. Thank you. I wondered about that. Can I ask a question? Um, to go back to the book for a minute, uh, when you discussed the issue of um, your your biological father's privacy and the privacy of donors, it, it was towards the end of the book. How early did you or did he raise that issue with you? And did you discuss it with him at length uh, was it something on his mind immediately? Uh, and if you did if you did discuss it earlier with him, what were his and his wife's reactions initially? I think I was aware that he was worried about his privacy from like minute one. Mm -hmm. uh, I just intuited or gleaned that he was a very private person, that this was like, you know, a boulder crashing into his life that when he looked me up he would have seen you know i wrote this in the book like on the one hand oh people are always so worried in these kinds of situations like what do you want from me are you after my money people are always thinking people are after their money in these situations always so you know he would have seen okay well this is good she's like looks like she has a good career and she's successful and she has a family of her own and she doesn't look like a very threatening person. On the other hand, he also would have seen that I'm a public person and that I've written about personal things and I've written about my family quite a bit and I've written about identity quite a bit. And I'm sure that it was not far from his mind that, um, that I'm a writer and that I would probably write about it or be public about it in some way. And, and I'm sure that that's what was on his mind when I first asked to meet with him. Uh, I think that that's part of why he felt so threatened by that. I think he like thought like Oprah was going to jump out of the bushes, you know, with a camera crew. Um, because of that, I, it felt very important to me to reassure him from the start that I was also concerned, not con that I was, that I was respectful of his privacy and I never pulled any punches about that I was going to write about it. I was always going to write about it. Um, I, I never hid that I was going to write about it. Um, what I, I don't remember that there was a moment where I sort of sat him down and had this conversation. I think it was almost just always clear to all of us that of course I was going to be writing about this. It was literally the story of my life. Um, what I did reassure him about was that I would um, do everything necessary to protect his identity, to change enough details so that he would not be findable and would not be recognizable, even by people who knew him, who might read the book. And then what I did is um, when I finished the manuscript and it was heading toward publication, but before, but you know, when there was still time to change things, I did something that writers I pretty much never do, which is I sent it to him. I sent him the manuscript. Um, and I, I wanted to make sure that he felt that his uh, identity was protected. And that was very important to me. But I also knew that I was taking a risk by sending it to him. Um, and I wanted him to like it. And I wanted him to feel that I was, that I was, um, that I told our story, our story accurately, uh, which he did. Um, and, you know, the part in the book that I think was tough was toward the very end when there's the conversation that I have with, with his wife, with Pilar about, um, you know, her basically saying to me, if there are others, you'll, you won't tell them. Um, because that's really the ethical conundrum. It's not one that I have found myself in because that hasn't happened, but if it did, what would I do? And I couldn't say no, I, I will, I won't, I won't respond if someone reaches out to me, because as I wrote in the book, I was that person. I don't, I don't, I, I can't imagine doing that to someone else who was in the shoes that I was in. Um, so we essentially agreed that if ever that were to happen, that I would 
um, basically be like be be the go between and let him know that there was another person out there who was um, a biological offspring. But that hasn't happened, and I think everyone was relieved when the book came out that the focus really wasn't on who's your biological father. It wasn't that kind of book. It was on the deeper philosophical, ethical, emotional, spiritual questions and not on the, you know, I mean, I remember when I was going on the Today Show and the producer, I mean, I know they had to ask me, they're like, do you have any pictures of you with your biological father? I'm like, yes, and have you read the book? Um, so, yeah. Danny, you have been so generous with your time and we know that you have a three o'clock engagement. And so we're going to say thank you. And uh, you've really given us such a lot to think about. I wrote down your question, who are our ancestors to us? Which is really what genealogy is about. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you so much for telling us about your book and about your family. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It was really a pleasure to talk to and be with all of you. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good stuff to think about. Happy so. Hanukkah, Danny. Thank Happy you. Hanukkah. Be safe and be well. Thanks, thank thanks you. for being thank the you. light. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I hope that was what everybody was looking for in our discussion. Did you find that helpful and meaningful, relevant, oh, yeah. instructive? Oh, yeah. Just so 